All right, we'll go ahead and get started with today's chat with Anna Barker as we discuss the wrap up of the Count of Monte Cristo. So Anna, it's all yours. Thank you so much, John. Hello everyone. And um, for the past month, I've been chuckling about Monte Cristo's ending with Victor, uh, Victor Hugo. Uh, I just said Victor Hugo, <laughs> do you see, this is the problem. I um, <laughs> Mental note, please leave at least um, 10 days between ending one 1300 page novel and starting another 1300 page novel. <laughs> so yes, Alexander Dumas um, ends the novel with the prophetic, um, uh, wait and hope. And uh, I think that's what all of us have been doing, waiting and hoping that Anna Barker will have enough time to finish commenting on five chapters. How ridiculous is it that we read a um, um, 117 chapter novel and the comment on the five chapters, the very last five chapters has been eluding us for the past month. But um, those of you who um, jumped into the um, 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 Le Miserable experience with me right after the Count of Monte Cristo, you are realizing that that is quite an undertaking. I, I did not anticipate it being it, it's just a completely differently paced novel. It requires so much of you mentally and physically and emotionally. It's so draining. Um, it's amazing because the Count of Monte Cristo, it's impossible to tell the plot. It really is impossible to tell the plot. To give the plot summary will not do the novel justice because it's just so complicated and so involved. Um, did you see that chart of how the characters are related to each other that I posted last night? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and one of you did the most brilliant thing when, uh, when you posted this uh, Jackson Pollock painting early on in, um, in the reading. And it just was like this. So this is this is my summary of the plot and the interrelations <laughs> of the characters of the Count of Monte Cristo. It's it's impossible to keep track of. With Le Miserable, you can really tell the plot of the novel in one paragraph. It it will be very precise. It will be very concise. There are about eight nine characters that we keep keep looking for in the novel. Maybe even less. Like seven or eight characters, and you can literally give the summary of the entire novel in one paragraph. With The Count of Monte Cristo, it's impossible. <laughs> you know, if somebody asks me, so what is the novel about? I, I just say, well, it's about this, 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 and this. And then I always say, oh, but wait, <laughs> there is also this. And then, oh, but wait, no, 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 no. There are about, you know, like 50 more characters that we really need to keep track of. And then, and then I say, oh, and, and there are also like banditi in Rome. <laughs> they meet in the San Sebastian catacombs. And what I absolutely loved, I listened to the last five chapters about three times. And I want to write something splendid about them. And I can't because I can't let go of this novel. It's, um, you know, you, you don't want to let go of the summer because it's, um, it's so lovely and lush and warm. And you don't want to go let go of the, the dream of the Count of Monte Cristo. You do not want to oh, let go of Rome and Carnival and um, the sunny beaches of the Mediterranean. And you do not want to let go of Chateau d'If. And you do not want to go let go of Marseille and all the fun that people are having in Paris. And then the novel becomes so incredibly dark and draining. And by the time we're exacting our revenge on the Villefort family, it's unbearable. And you, at, I mean, at some point you just you just want Monte Cristo to stop because it's too much. And do you remember when Cadruce is killed um, and uh, by Benedetto, and he says one, and um, and it gives you this like eerie feeling. You have the stone in your stomach, thinking like, oh my God, where where are we going now? Are we going to be complicit in all of these murders? Because like we are cheering for the hero. And the hero seems to just become this, you know, one track mind, um, consistent and persistent in um, in executing his plot of revenge. Um, and then um, and then you're realizing that, well, you know, Danglar, oh my gosh, he's such a scumbag. <laughs> he's just such a scumbag. The nicest thing about the last five chapters is when he is in the San Sebastian catacombs and he's like, oh, this is great. They left me my 5 million francs. What stupid, stupid robbers. And then at one point, I mean, the man is eating the mat in his cell. And, um, and you know, when he finds out, you know, every meal is the same price. You can have a feast or you can have a crust of dry bread. It doesn't matter. 
um, and you are going to stay here as long as we need to feed you five million francs worth of food, and then you're free. And it's amazing because then the Count of Monte Cristo shows, shows up in his cell as he always reveals himself. He he never allows a character to go into the darkness of their conscience without knowing just who it was that exacted his revenge. And so he appears to him and, and Danglar says, oh, the Count of Monte Cristo. And he says, no, Edmond Dantes. And um, and um, yeah, that, that's the end, but it's amazing. He says, oh, and all that money you stole from the hospitals, the 5 million francs that you stole from the hospitals, it has been replaced. So, you know, you almost feel like, okay, well, you know, the hospitals were not robbed <laughs> after all. And, but it's amazing how Monte Cristo's revenge on Danglar is tampered by what has happened in the Villefort family, because that is absolutely dreadful. And I mean, it's, it's unspeakable. Um, and he leads Madame de Villefort into this, he leads her onto the murderer's path. I mean, if not for Monte Cristo, she would have found a way anyway, because she was just such a cleverly conniving woman, and her husband was just so incredibly despicable. I mean, Villefort was just looking for the worst in everyone, because he wanted to, um, he wanted to find people who are worse than him, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing about Villefort. He knew that he committed so many transgressions in his life in service of the law, or so he presumed, um, that he absolutely had to keep digging into the darkness of other human beings to keep comforting himself with the thought, aha, uh -huh, you know, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Uh, other people are so much worse than me. And then what he has to face is almost inhuman. And, um, and uh, he's mad and he's rushing around his, um, his Parisian yard digging for the box. And, uh, and it's unbearable and, and wife and son gone. Um, that's when that's when um, Monte Cristo's um, wish for revenge is tempered. He doesn't exact the same kind of revenge on Danglar. Danglar, Danglar has dealt with extremely cleverly, and um, one of my former students pointed out um, that Danglar is a person who has a literary thought at the very end because he remembers reading. Don Quixote, because the, the moment of imprisonment by bandits reminded him of a section in Don Quixote, which is the one book that he read. And so the student of mine said, look, even Danglar has literary thoughts. So <laughs> is that a hint? Are we going to do Don Quixote next? And uh, wouldn't that be nice? So anyway, um, and so we have, um, oh, and, and uh, so what, what does everybody think? Everyone wants to talk about Mercedes. And um, and what happens to the to the Fernand family? Um, I love all of those all of those conversations that uh, Fernand has with um, with Monte Cristo, where he's constantly letting Fernand know that he appreciates the nobility um, of the Morcer family. And it, it is just so cruel. It's as if he's just walking around with this little dagger and he keeps just twisting the handle and twisting the handle all the time. And, um, and, then, and then when the wound is nice and big, he just starts pouring lots and lots of salt into it. And um, I mean, there's, there's delicious cruelty in uh, Monte Cristo, but it's so amazing that at the very, very end, um, at the very end of the novel, we get to revisit all the places that we love the most. And Alexander Dumas knows us, the readers. I mean, isn't that remarkable? The novel was published in 1844. And here we are in 2022. And Dumas knows what we want. <laughs> we want to walk down the sunny streets of Marseille one more time because we were so happy there. And, and we want to go back to the Chateau d'If. And we want to, you know, hear the a meaningless chatter of um, of the guard who is not a prison guard anymore. He's just kind of like a night watch, you know. Here's this empty, big, um, stupendously uh, cruel and menacing fortress that looks so benign now. And we just need to have a guard who, you know, he chatted to the old prison guards and he tells stories for a little bit of money. And um, it reminds me of something that actually Victor Hugo says about the Battle of Waterloo. He gives this absolutely 
horrific paragraph of death and death and death and death and death. And all this happened so that a peasant would walk up to a traveler and say, give me a few francs and I'll tell you what exactly happened um, during the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> and so it's the same kind of moment, you know, just give me a little bit of money and I'll tell you exactly what happened to all the prisoners here. And it's so fanciful that, um, that, um, Edmond Dantes actually wants to have that experience. It's as if he's seeking closure. It's as if he's, well, you know, he's seeking his better self. He, he's seeking that young boy who ended up there at the age of 19. How, um, how dear it would be for all of us to all of a sudden walk into a place where we, we were 19 and we were better than we are now. We were silly and clueless and, and uh, despicable and, and angry and arrogant, but, but we were those people that we can never be again. And so he walks into the space where he was perfect. He was, uh, he was a charming, witty, sweet young man with an entire life ahead of him. And he walks into that space, bitter, remorseful, broken man um, who has had all of his wishes granted and yet he has no peace. And, uh, and how wonderful it would be to be the Edmond Dantes from the very, very beginning of the novel. He walks into that cell and then this wonderful bumbling um, um, fortress guard tells him about how all of these people escaped. And he says, of course it was the young men who dug the tunnel because the old man was too frail. And it's so it's so amusing for um, the kind of Monte Cristo to hear these stories because uh, he, he knows the truth. And then, um, and then he, um, he says, oh, and I found something in the cell. And, um, and um, Edmond immediately knows that, um, you know, tools, <laughs> yes. And the guard says, of course, how did you know? And uh, Edmond does not want to reveal too much, but then at that, that point guard says, well, I found something else. It's kind of a little, little strange, but special. Let me fetch it for you. And let me leave the light for you. There's no electricity then, remember? <laughs> There's absolutely no electricity. There's no flip the switch and light turns on. You have to walk around with a torch. And uh, so, um, he, um, he says, no, I, I don't need light. I can see well enough in the dark. And he says, funny thing is, the prisoner in the cell, that's the, they say he too could see in the dark well enough. And of course, um, Edmond Dantes thought is, you know, he, he earned it. I mean, seven, 17 years of darkness teaches you much about darkness. And, um, and then, of course, he receives the most magnificent of gifts. He receives the, the treatise on the unification of Italy by Abbe Faria. So those, I mean, that when we lost that character, do you remember that was like, I don't know, 300 years ago when we lost Abbe Faria, when he has his final third fit and the medicine that, um, that he's taking does not revive him and the horror that Edmond Dantes feels that he's all alone in the world now. And, um, and then that wicked, absolutely mad, plan to substitute a living body for a corp, uh, 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 instead of a corpse and um, an escape. Um, and he receives the, the sum total of knowledge written by the hand that has given him all the tools that he has utilized for better or worse in his life. And um, it's amazing, those of you who are reading the Count of Monte Cristo now, sorry, <laughs> Le Miserable now, do you see I, I exist in the world of like the two books are just crushing my brain. Um, it's amazing to what extent the, the, um, the Bishop of Dean serves as that kind of character to Jean Valjean, even though Jean Valjean learned to read um, in the prison, but he learned to read in order to exact revenge. So it's amazing that both of these characters acquire knowledge in order to exact revenge. And both of these characters are known by their numbers. It's amazing that um, uh, when um, um, the Count of Monte Cristo asks the, the fortress guard, what was the name of the prisoner who lived here? He's given a number. And then when the guard leaves, um, the Count of Monte Cristo says, uh, Villefort. Villefort completely erased him from, from history, from memory, precisely because the letter he was supposed to deliver from, from the usurper, <laughs> from Antichrist Napoleon, from the island of Elba to Paris was to Villefort's father, Norquier and um, it would have destroyed his life um, if anybody would have found out. So all the information about this arrest was burned and the name of the person uh, was erased. Um, so Edmond Dantes ceased to exist 
in all possible ways, including legal ways. And the only thing that even this, this guard knows is a number. And so, um, yes, so there are so many similarities between these two characters, Jean Valjean and Mon Dantes, but they're very, very different at the same time. Um, well, we, um, we talked about Cadruz, that was a brutal death. Um, we talked about um, uh, the Morcer family and Fernand. He shot himself because he couldn't face the dishonor. dishonor. And it's fascinating. He um, he keeps making money uh, by betraying people, he, people who trust him. Um, so, and it's fascinating because Fernand does go to the Battle of Waterloo. So, the the, the Battle of Waterloo also figures in this novel as well as in uh, in uh, Le Miserable. Fernand actually allies with an Englishman during the Battle of Waterloo. So he betrays France on the Battle of Waterloo. I mean, no. No worse indictment for Frenchmen than betraying friends at Waterloo. But he does that. He, you know, he he teams up with an Englishman and then he starts amassing a fortune. And then in 1823, when the French get involved in Spain, because they want to give complete and absolute power to the Bourbon monarch of Spain, who is a relative. Oh my goodness, that's my puppy barking. Sorry. <laughs> he was sound asleep. <laughs> So yes, he uh, Fernand um, then participates in this um, French um, um, French uh, involvement in Spain to um, make sure that the Bourbon monarch of Spain um, gains absolute power now that the Bourbon are back on the throne in France, right? And he makes a lot of money on that venture as well. And then he gets involved with um, the uh, Turkish Ottoman uh, governance of Greece. And this is where he destroys um, the family of um, Haide. Um, and um, I mean, her fate is horrific. Her father is betrayed and murdered by the French officer whom he trusted. And not only that, he sells the mother, Vasiliki, and um, the daughter on a slave market in um, Turkey. And, um, and when Vasiliki comes into Istanbul and she sees the head of her husband on a pole, she dies of grief and um, poor Haide has to fend for herself in a world where she is a female slave. And um, we have so many, it's hard for us to understand a character of Haide because she is so slavishly devoted to Monte Cristo, but he literally saves her from a life of complete subservience and personal non-existence. And so he keeps asking her, what do you want? And she always keeps saying, I want what you want. Um, and it, it is shocking to us that she has complete lack of agency, but this is a woman who all her life could not assume to have any wishes of her own. And, um, and you know, Monte Cristo all of a sudden just leaving, <laughs> disappearing. He does a disappearing act at the end of the novel. And it's fascinating how he invites uh, Maximilian to the caves on the island of Monte Cristo. So the novel ends on the island of Monte Cristo and he gives him the same hashish that he gives to Franz de Pigné. And uh, in Franz de Pigné's vision, there are all of these gorgeous women who appear and he has a marvelous dream. And then he wakes up to a very marvelous reality. <laughs> He's in a beautiful, beautiful cave surrounded with Persian rugs and um, amazing luxury. Um, but Maximilian wakes up from the same dose of hashish and he sees, of course, his beloved. And, um, and it's amazing that, um, that she was rescued, um, that, um, they're, they're re reunited. And it's it's fascinating, this conversation that Maximilian has with, um, with um, the Count of Monte Cristo. Maximilian keeps going to the grave. Um, uh, and he, he knows that Valentin is gone. And he, he does not want to live. And the Count of Monte Cristo pushes it to the limit. He, he basically says, look, if you cannot have Valentin, would you die? And Maximilian is, the, is just saying there is no meaning um, of life for me. And uh, do you see what happened to Edmond Dantes? He died, you know, uh, um, Mercedes was told that Edmond Dantes is dead. And then um, two years later, she was married to another man. And so what um, the Count of Monte Cristo is doing is absolutely cruel, but he keeps pushing Maximilian to make the confession. Can you live without her? 
does, does the death of Valentin actually mean death to you? Or will this be something that um, you can recover from? And Maximilian is adamant that he does not want to live. And so he takes the hashish, assuming that uh, Monte Cristo is just offering him easy way out, a painless death. And then the Count of Monte Cristo explains to him that if you are willing to go through this experience of descending into death and being resurrected, you are going to be so much stronger for it. It is absolutely horrifically cruel to do this to Maximilian. But what the Count of Monte Cristo is doing, he is testing him the way Mercedes was tested. And, um, and Maximilian passes the test. He is so romantic. I mean, Maximilian is a very, very romantic character. It's just, he, he sort of exhibits all the tropes of the romantic character. He is like this dark brooding officer. He's very young, but he already has the Legion of Honor. Um, he saved uh, Franz de Pigny's life in North Africa because otherwise he would have been dead. Um, he, he's constantly courting death and, and um, his sister is very happily married and they are just, the sweet couple, you know, the description of uh, of the Morel sister and her husband is so charming. Like, wherever she is sitting, he's sitting. Whatever he is doing, she's doing. If you're looking for one, the other will be next to them. It, it's just such a sweet, charming domesticity that um, Dumas did not know. He, uh, he, he writes the ideal of, uh, of married life that he never experienced in his life. Um, and uh, then the brooding Maximilian is so different from his sister, but the Count of Monte Cristo keeps pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And he, he is, he's being incredibly cruel. He's, he's devilish with him. He's just constantly saying, you want to die? You want to die? Oh, you want to die? Are you sure you want to die? Who badly do you want to die? And, and there's something just very, very broodingly romantic about this. Yes, I want to die. Here is my bare chest. Stab me now because Valentin is gone. Yeah. <laughs> so that is that is the overwrought Maximilian. And uh, and he has all of the tropes of the romantic hero. You know, like you have to find your romantic hero weeping over a grave in a dark cemetery. So that's um, check. <laughs> Maximilian has been seen weeping over graves in cemeteries. But then all of those transfigurations that he is doing, you know, he becomes charmingly pastoral, which is also so romantic. Remember, he becomes the Lucerne farmer, and he's wearing this, you know, farmer's blouse. And they're constantly meeting by the chink in the wall, just like Pyramus and Thisbe. So, in addition to this, the, the, he 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 gives him, the, him this like this urban pastoral role where he's like a farmer in the middle of Paris because he all of a sudden rents this field where he is growing lucerne, and then he's also in infusing these two characters with. Um, ancient Greek uh, mythological qualities because they are like Pyramus and Thisbe. And of course, if Pyramus and Thisbe sound familiar to us, it's the play within the play in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream of, um, of Shakespeare. So the, the, the actors enact um, this play for um, Titania and Oberon's wedding. And um, it, is, it is a very, very silly play, but it's such a sad story. And so, yeah, so they are the Pyramus and Thisbe. And it's fascinating how he takes it all the way to like the ultimate death of Thisbe. But then of course he saves Pyramus. And it's fascinating that when um, he appears in front of Valentine and he rents the house next door and he digs the tunnel. I mean, it's just so thrilling. And he um, he watches over Valentine and he makes sure that whatever drink, appe drink appears on her nightstand is poured out. Um, and replaced. And then um, he he enters when the uh, stepmother ups the dose. And um, and he says to Valentin, look, your father should have been standing here. You know, this is a huge indictment of Belfort at that moment because um, um, Dantes is saying, I'm not your father, but I am taking your father's place um, because I'm going to save you. And so just as the, uh, the way he saved Valentin from poison, um, he um, he does a bit of resurrection with Maximilian. He gave he gives him poison, but the poison is hashish. And we know that at, at some point we're just sort of wondering why do we have to have that episode with Franz de Pigny going to the island to experience cave life with Oriental flair and the taking of hashish? Well, it's because when we get to the very end of the novel we know that Maximilian is not going to die. And, and if we remember that whole 
fanciful um, moment was um, was France, and we know what happens to France. We're just sort of feeling like, okay, well, you know, the Count of Monte Cristo is being dramatic, but Maximilian will be just fine. And so we we end the novel in a very positive way. We have a young couple standing on an island, and um, he is asking Valentine to. Uh, give away all the money that she's going to inherit from her father to charity, which is very nice, right? And then he is um, he is giving his um, country house, and he is giving his um, his um, Paris house and um, everything that he owns in France to Maximilian as Val and Valentine as their wedding wedding present, and he's off. Where where are they going? Where, where are those two going? Did you read my note about um, the intersection of Europe and Asia that I wrote um, last night? Um, it um, I mean that that could be a like a book long essay um, about um, Satan because in in Milton's Paradise Lost, Satan is always traveling the globe and trying to talk to the entities in the far reaches of the of the world about how to spite God. <laughs> and so this revenge plot. So Satan in uh, in Paradise Lost is very upset with God because Satan was uh, God's favorite creation. He um, he really created, you know, the, these, these angels um, as his pet things. <laughs> and uh, these angels sort of felt like, oh, you know, the rules are too stringent and it, it is just impossible to live like this. And so they decide to stage a little rebellion and they are hurled out of paradise. And then God is like, okay, well, you know, I'm done with those uh, troublesome beings. Let me create a perfect pair, a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. And then Satan, of course, is watching God's interaction with Adam and um, all of the uh, archangels are coming to talk to, um, uh, to um, um, Adam and Eve. And uh, they have these marvelous conversations. And the first time Satan beholds Eve, He's completely, completely beyond himself. He he has sort of an older sibling jealousy fit because he's just saying, I was God's favored being. How could I fall so low? And how come did this Eve? How why is she so attractive? And why is she so so incredibly beautiful? And and how come that Adam gets an Eve and I'm all alone? And you know, I'm having um um having intercourse with death and the baby we beget is sin and and my my life is so meaningless and so that is what spurs um satan into this revenge um against god and of course we know what what happens to monte cristo his revenge against god is uh, against fate and against every single person who caused um his tremendous suffering is the plot of the entire book and then we have Batman, who is who is um, inspired by both of these characters. He he seeks revenge, and it's fascinating that in the Batman comics, he actually seeks um, Eastern wisdom, and he learns Eastern martial martial arts in order to prepare himself both mentally and physically for the fight that he has to face in his life. So um, Monte Cristo is off to do these absolutely amazing things, um, travel the world, and um, try to find meaning in his life again, right? Um, because what gave him meaning all, all, the, all these years is his desire to revenge himself against um, the people who wronged him. And those people are Danglar, Czech, Kadrus, Czech, and of course, um, Fernand, Czech, and Dilfor. And um, and in the process of exacting his revenge, he manages to save two young people who are caught up in all of these trials and tribulations. And those two people are Maximilian and Valentine. And they become what he could have been with Mercedes if fate would not have played such a nasty trick um, with them. Um, at this point, let me check the questions. Yes to Don Quixote, a shift after Anna Karenina, no joke. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, honestly, I don't blame Mercedes at all. And the thumbs up was for Don Quixote. So um, I'm mental note, never go from one 1300 page novel to the next 1300 page novel without a break. 
um, then um, I'm going to um, write my comment to the last four chapters. And I really wanted to give you those extra posts. Um, um, and I, I, I did enjoy Uncharted more than I thought I would. I did not want to watch the movie because it just seemed like yet another one of those Hollywood block, blockbuster nonsense things. But I enjoyed it so much that I've seen it three times. <laughs> and I, and I keep, keep finding little charming things about it. I'm, I'm very picky about movies. They have to be good and the dialogue has to be good and they have to be clever and they have to be fun. And uh, I detest swearing and blood and violence. But this was, um, this was very well done, very, very well done. And, so, and Monte Cristo is mentioned in the film. That's why I am recommending it to you, but you have to watch to the very, very, very end or else you will miss the reference. So, um, so that is a, a fun um, treasure seeking adventure that, um, and the reason why I gave you that film title is um, several of you asked me about uh, Count of Monte Cristo film adaptations. And I've tried to watch three of them and they are dreadful. They are worse than terrible. Um, I don't understand how can directors approach the perfect book and mess it up so badly. I mean, to the point where, you know, like one of the versions that I started watching, they filmed um, the, the Chateau d'If in Malta, which is fabulous. You know, Napoleon has been to Malta and he did he did take Malta from the um, from the Knights, uh, Knights um, of Malta. But I visited Chateau d'If. It's perfect. It's it's infinitely filmable. And, and just just little silly things like this. And then every single adaptation of the Count of Monte Cristo messes with the plot. And it's so perfect. You can't, you can't improve on this plot. It is just so spectacularly, fancifully coherent. Um, that, you know, so no, no good adaptation, sorry. And then um, I saw a, a message from John Canyon. So um, John, if there are any questions, um, could you read them to me? Or if anybody wants question, to ask questions at this point, please go ahead. Sure, uh, well, Michael had jumped in when you were talking about the film versions of this and said he thought the film would have to be many, many episodes in a series, which, uh, as someone who read through it, I agree. <laughs> yes. How about um, a 117 part miniseries? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a lot of seasons. Okay. Yes. Well, th that's about the Lands of Lost, which is the only TV show I've ever seen. I've never watched a single one of these endless TV shows, but um, Lost mentions that my, my kids hooked me on Lost because my son told me, oh, at one point, one of the characters is reading um, Brother Scaramazzo, and I'm like, okay, I have to watch this. And then the shocking thing happened. I watched the whole thing in one week. I mean, the whole family was concerned, <laughs> but I couldn't, I couldn't stop watching it. Um, but it has that, that kind of uh, plot narrative that is incredibly, incredibly engrossing, like the Count of Monte Cristo. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so Jody says, I felt like the ending was just trying to end quickly. And I was surprised by his relationship with Haiti. Uh, so any comments about that? Yeah. I, well, you know, I, I have known that this is coming since I was like 16 years old. So it doesn't surprise me. And, um, and there is this mystique about what the Orient has to offer about Haide that, um, is enticing. Um, he wants adventures. You know, he 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 wants. He does not want to touch the earth anymore. He's he's through his people. He is through his friends. Uh, remember, he says when he arrives to Paris that he has never been to Paris, and he has never been to Paris. He was a young man, but it's fascinating. He knows the Mediterranean. Remember when um, when he tries to. Um, pass himself off as a sailor. He says that he's from Malta and he can be taken for a person from, um, from um, Corsica. He can be a person from Elba. He could be a person from Cyprus, Crete, Malta, just any one of the Mediterranean islands because he knows all of them. So he does not belong to Europe. He belongs to the sea. He belongs to the Mediterranean. So for me, the ending is very gratifying because he goes back to what he was at 19. And, and you have to understand that these kids who would start sailing, you know, kids who lived in cities like Marseille, 
they would start sailing when they were 10, 11, 12. They would, they would start doing these journeys because that's how you learn. <laughs> it's, it's very, very hard to figure out how to be this, um, this expert sailor. And he was the best swimmer of, uh, of anyone he knew in Marseille. And he, he was occasionally a resident of Marseille um, the past 10 years of his life, and he was only 19 at the beginning of the novel. So it does not surprise me that he chooses not to be in places like, you know, Milan and Rome and Venice and, and uh, Paris. He belongs to the sea. And he, um, for me, the ending is extremely gratifying because he just, he leaves civilization behind because it's rotten to the core. And do you see how the one thing that we did not talk about um, as much as I wish we would have was to what extent um, Alexander Dumas is exposing the rotten nature of, um, of the July monarchy, where it, the, whole, the whole enterprise is about making money. Everyone is making money. Everyone is buying titles. Everyone is becoming baron this. I mean, Doug Lahr, a baron, that's a joke. And all of them have Legion of Honor. You know, like um, before, uh, Noirtier got it during the, uh, during the time when he was a senator, when, um, uh, when Napoleon was in charge, right? So he got it during Napoleon's time. But then, as I mentioned in, um, in my note on the Legion of Honor, um, Fernand has a Legion of Honor, um, Danglar has a Legion of Honor, Milfour has a Legion of Honor. And these people are crooks. They're just lining their pockets. So in so many ways, it is a novel that exposes the social mores of uh, post-Napoleonic France. And um, Napoleon looms large in this novel, um, at least during the time of Napoleon, you received the Legion of Honor if you did heroic deeds for France. At this point, you are receiving the Legion of Honor because you line your pockets in such a splendid way that people admire um, your the, the sheer level of your corruption. And so um, that is um, that is um, Alexander Dumas. Um, conclusion about what is happening in France in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, people are just there for themselves, not for the glorification of France. And um, Monte Cristo does not belong to this world. He belongs to the world of adventure. And um, he leaves seeking adventure. And, and that's precisely why Haide is so important in his life, because she belongs to all of these worlds. Um, she was born in Greece, and she is Greek, right? But she was born in Greece under Ottoman Turkish rule, right? So Greece is Turkish at this point. And her mother is an Eastern Christian. She's a Greek Christian. Um, but um, her father is Muslim. And um, she lived in Greece during her childhood, but she was a slave in Turkey. And um, what is between these two worlds is the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea and the Marble Sea. And, um, and that's the world that fascinates Monte Cristo. He wants, he wants to be a part of the world where the, the spaces between stages are fluid. And, and he loves that fluidity. He is, he is the man of fluid spaces like the air and the sea. That's what is so important about being a sailor. And so he goes back to doing what he loved when he was a teenager, being a sailor. And, and, but at this point, he has to worry about absolutely nothing, just the sea and the wind and, and then the sun and the fun. And if I could do anything at all with my life, I would take off from the island of Monte Cristo and never look back at civilization, says Anna, who went to the opera three times in the past week. <laughs> All right, we don't have any other questions here. Um, one thing, Douglas had put a comment in, but it looked like he thought he was mixing it up with uh, our current reading. And I thought I would bring up, I, I've noticed so many parallels already in, in Les Miserables and with Count of Monte Cristo, particularly in the, the notion of Jean Valjean with, uh, with Edmond Dantes. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because you've alluded to like the order in which we're reading these and, and the influence of one on the other and all of this. And maybe that would, we're obviously so, many of us still reading Les Miserables and having just finished yeah. Monte Cristo. Right. Well, it, it was planned um, this way for a reason. And we started, remember Balzac's Colonel Chabert? And there is that absolutely horrible, horrible, horrible scene 
where he is trying to dig himself out from under corpses. Um, and um, and he the, the description says that um, he was grateful for this arm that seemed to have belonged to a Hercules that he found because it allowed him to dig with this extension. I mean, it's it's like absolutely horrible. And remember, I um, I posted when we were reading that Jericho's The Raft of the Medusa, um, this, this horrible painting of the most horrendous, horrendous mishap that happened with, um, with the people who were sailing to Africa on this ship Medusa and the raft was out at sea with cannibalism and God knows what, what else for days. It was a, a catastrophe for the French government. Um, it was just the, the biggest indictment on the incompetence of the, of the captain and all, all of that stuff. Um, Hugo mentions that in that all important chapter, the year 1817, and um, the, the sinking of the Medusa is mentioned there. But so do you remember that Colonel Chabert, the digging from under the corpses? Well, that's the passage that we are going to read in um, Le Miserable in a couple of days, or I think tomorrow. Um, there'll be a character who will be digging himself up from under corpses in. Um, the Count of Monte Cristo. So that's, sorry, in, uh, in Le Miserable. So that's why I wanted to read um, Colonel Chabert of Balzac, because that is the, the connection with Le Miserable and that scene at the Battle of Waterloo. And then you're wondering, why did we have to read Stendhal's The Red and the Black? Well, the exuberance of, um, of um, um, this young, um, exuberant, charming, a uh, clueless young man is um, is just so incredibly reminiscent of Edmond Dantes at the very beginning, um, and their lives end up very differently. But watch for a character that we'll meet in volume three of um, Le Miserable. We are going to encounter a character who will be absolutely madly in love with Napoleon. I mean, it will be a passion. It will be the kind of passion where you will have to um, rip your tie off um, unbutton your buttons of your collar, open the window. Hopefully there'll be a storm outside that will be whipping your face with cold rain because that's exactly what one character does. And all he can think of when he's looking out there is Napoleon. <laughs> so you will, you will be remembering the, uh, the charming pages um, of Stendhal's The Red and the Black um, where Napoleon is hidden, portraits of Napoleon and hidden, are hidden in the mattresses and the, um, the memoirs of Napoleon are lost in a stream at the very beginning of the novel. So we will, we will be going back to the significance of um, the red and the black in this continuum when we get to volume three of um, Le Miserable. And then yes, John, there are so many um, uh, connections between the Count of Monte Cristo and uh, and um, Le Miserable, first of all, um, there, is a, there is a reason why um, Jean Valjean does not start exacting revenge. And that reason is the Bishop of Dean, that man who said, I'm buying your soul from darkness with this silver. And that has never, <clears throat> never happened to Edmond Dantes. So Edmond Dantes has his Abbe Faria, who is a humanist. Um, he's a scientist. Um, he is um, he's someone who gives him the tools. And he tells Dantes that with these tools, you can be good. And Dantes is thinking in his head, ah, but with these tools, I can be bad. And, and he relishes this, this power that he has. Um, and of course, he, he gains tremendous amount of wealth. And it's remarkable because Jean Valjean becomes also very comfortably well off. I mean, he becomes a millionaire. He gives away an awful lot of his money to better the town where his factory is located. Then both of them are known by numbers, right? So um, they're both reduced, their humanity is completely, they're stripped of their humanity. And, um, and Jean Valjean is reduced to a number and Edmond Dantes is reduced to a number. Um, they change names all the time. Just think how many names um, Edmond Dantes has, right? Um, so um, he is, um, he's the Count of Monte Cristo, of course but he appears in so many disguises to so many characters. And so he uh, he's this Englishman, enigmatic Englishman. And it's fascinating. I love that. I love that moment where he appears as the Abbe and the, the Englishman. 
at the same time in the same place, just changing his disguises. And then, of course, the person who comes to talk to him is Bill Four, also in disguise. And so they are, they are definitely, um, they are, they are battling with each other, even, even through their usage of disguises. So Jean Valjean has to conceal his identity all the time. And so does Edmond Dantes. Um, and he reveals his identity only in those moments when he finally faces the characters, when he's ready to administer the blow. And the hardest for us as readers to read his encounters with Mercedes. And he has two encounters. Um, when um, when she comes to plead for his, for the life of her son, and then when um, two unbearable encounters, and then of course um, when he's saying goodbye to her forever um, in Marseille, um, and uh, there's there are two more instances where Jean Valjean and uh, Edmond Dantes are very similar, but I can't tell you about those yet because that will be giving away. Too many super thrilling um, uh, plot elements. One of them is actually coming up in volume two. So we just started volume two. And something that happened to Edmond Dantes will happen to Jean Valjean in volume two. And then um, we'll be meeting a character very similar to the main character of The Red and the Black in volume three of The Miserable. So yes, there is a reason why these novels are happening the way they're happening. And, um, and we'll be reading Tolstoy a year from now in the fall of 23. And I'm still wondering how to fill our lives in late September and summer. And um, people are getting me, giving me all kinds of suggestions, like people are clamoring for Byron. And uh, I love it. <laughs> this is amazing. I finally found lunatics who love Byron as much as I do. Nobody reads Byron anymore. It's, it's just so... Byron who? <laughs> so yes, we'll we'll put Byron on our list and I'll I'll try to figure out how to fit him into our reading schedule. So and and then sometime in late winter, early spring, we'll read um Madame Bovary of Flaubert, which all the critics consider to be the best French novel ever written. But after after these three novels, I don't know. <laughs> Can Flaubert try to convince us. We are, we, we, we will be, we will be seasoned readers of French literature and it will take some doing to convince us that you can beat um, the Count of Monte Cristo or the Miserable. But at the same time, they're very, very different novels. As I said at the beginning, it's impossible to summarize the Count of Monte Cristo. There are so many characters. There are so many plot twists. There are, there are so many side branches. Just the whole, the whole side branch was Benedetto. The whole side branch was, um, was the relationship between Madame Danglars and Villefort. The whole um, side, side plot was Noirtier um, and the fact that he killed the father of Franz de Pinay in a duel. <laughs> so, you know, we have a duel in this novel. And then, um, and then the whole subplot was uh, those charming um, Roman banditi. And uh, it seems like we spend a big chunk of the novel partying in Rome. And, um, and then we are wondering, like, why are we there for such a long time? And then, of course, Dumas at the end tells us, hey, because, you know, I needed to tell you about the life of um, Roman Banditi, because that's where Danglar is going to end up. And we are going to be best friends. And, you know, you, you can tell that I'm a book person, right? Because I noticed that Danglar is thinking of um, Don Quixote when he's in prison. Uh, Luigi Vampa, the bandit chief is reading Alexander Dumas' father's and Napoleon's favorite book, um, Julius Caesar's Conquest of Gaul, when the young men are uh, stranded in the uh, catacombs of San Sebastian. And he is reading the life of Alexander. So he's reading Plutarch's lives. I actually, when I was in my office, um, I pulled off the shelf, Plutarch's lives. It's two tomes this thick. And um, sometimes that book is called Parallel Lives because he compares um, famous Greek people from Greek history and Greek mythology and famous Romans. And so uh, Luigi Vampa, our favorite Italian bandit, is reading the life of Alexander the Great from Plutarch. And so I'm going to probably just post the, the sheer voluminousness of... Um, it's amazing, like all the books that Roman bandits read in the Count of Monte Cristo are books that I just happen to have on the shelf in my office. I'm just like, yes, I love Roman bandits and their reading habits. All right, that leaves us an interesting segue here, Anna. But um, so 
our participants were noting a few other uh, similarities between those two characters in the chat, but then Lisa had jumped in and said, it's interesting that the characters are so similar and the books are commentary on the government and society, but Les Mis is more focused on specific social ills. Mm -hmm. and then she asked, Hugo seems to have ideas about how to fix things, but Dumas is less concerned on that account. Is that... Yeah. Yeah, Hugo. Hugo is there to have. Oh, sorry, um, Alexander Dumas is there to have fun, and he was he he was just having pretty much fun all his life. He he was this larger than life, gregarious person, absolutely adored by women. The the women are countless, and and it's amazing. He writes this whole novel like in one year at the same time as he's writing Three Musketeers. And his son that he fathered um, at the age of 20 is living with him too. And, you know, his son is like 20, 21, and he is like 40, 42, 43. And they're having way too much fun together in very inappropriate ways by visiting women who uh, are uh, of dubious reputation, but they're having so much fun. I mean, it's, it's just Alexander Dumas. And then he travels all over Europe and he writes cookbooks and he writes travel narratives, and he writes sequels to sequels for his novels. So he writes two sequels of the of the um, of the Three Musketeers, and then he writes many other historical novels. He um, he writes Queen Margot, which I would love to reread. I'll probably try to do that sometime in January when I'm just having fun. And um, and I mean, I don't know, we should just read The Three Musketeers sometime. Hey, how about if we spend a whole year reading The Three Musketeers and then sequel one and sequel two? <laughs> then that will be ahead of everyone else. We'll know everything. So he is just fun. He's just this whimsical, fun, extremely large person because he loved to eat. He loved to cook. He loved life. Um, Victor Hugo is a very different character, and they were friends. They they knew each other very very well. They were born the same year, um, but Victor Hugo was a politician. He was um, in the House of Peers. At the end of his life, he's a senator. Um, he he actually is on the barricades in 1848 on the government side. <laughs> he actually is sent by the government to suppress one of the barricades. And he felt that he was justified in suppressing this barricade because he was standing for France. And um, as soon as I am done um, offering commentary on the Count of Monte Cristo, and we finally, finally just say goodbye to Alexander Dumas, although it's, it's very sad to do so. Um, I'm going to write a couple of extra comments on um, Victor Hugo's life, which is stunning, absolutely, absolutely stunning. And then where he writes and finishes um, Le Miserable is just the most unusual place you can imagine. And I'm not going to say anything else because this is not uh, a Zoom on, on uh, Le Miserable, but we need to have a Zoom on Le Miserable soon because we just finished volume one. Um, so yes, Alexander Dumas was you know, larger than life human being. Um, I don't think he has ever married. He fathered a bunch of illegitimate children. He uh, considered this one child whose name was also Alexander Dumas to be like his kid. <laughs> and so he is the one who writes The Lady with the Camellias, which becomes a very famous play. And then um, um, Giuseppe Verdi sees the play in Paris and he turns it into his opera La Traviata. So that's the connection of the Dumas family. But, but remember, Dumas is the name of a Haitian slave woman because Thomas Alexander Dumas, who becomes the Napoleonic general, he does not want to take his aristocratic father's last name. And so when the revolution happens, he takes a black woman's last name and it becomes the name that is glorified for three generations of these larger than life, gregarious, um, absolutely wildly exciting Frenchman. And um, so Thomas Alexander Dumas was the Napoleonic general. Uh, he actually, speaking of um, Napoleon, um, the father of Alexander Dumas, the novelist, was with Napoleon on Malta when Napoleon destroyed the Maltese order. And then he sailed with Napoleon to Egypt. And then he was in Egypt during all of the <laughs> triumphs and tribulations of that catastrophic invasion. And then he ended up in jail in the, in the south of Italy where his health was horribly undermined. 
do you see that in the story of the Count of Monte Cristo, Alexander Dumas is writing the story of his father, um, his father who was thrown in jail and his mother who waited for him. And Alexander Dumas, the writer, was conceived after his father returns from Egypt and from his imprisonment in the, in the south of, uh, of Italy. So Alexander Dumas is the, the product of the triumph of patience of a woman who waited in the Ecotre for this man to come back. And, and he was completely, completely destroyed. And I think um, Alexander Dumas was what, four, five, six years old when his father died. Um, very, very tragic. And, um, but the mother lived long enough to see her little boy's triumph. And so it's, it's amazing that a Haitian slave's last name becomes glorified in, the, in three generations of, um, of these charming Frenchmen who, um, who make France <laughs> great in so many ways. And I told you, right, that um, Victor Hugo had to suffer a great deal of racism. Uh, sorry. Alexander Dumas. No, let's stop talking about talking about Victor Hugo. Alexander Dumas had to suffer much racism during his life. Um, I've seen cartoons where he was depicted in extremely unflattering ways. It was horrible, um, and um, and all of those um, um, attacks on him were consistent throughout his life. Um, and so, when it was the 200th anniversary of his death, the French government felt that it was not. Um, appropriate for them to forget the greatness of someone like Alexander Dumas. So he was exhumed. He was buried with his mom and dad in the Ecotre, and I visited that cemetery, and it is a fine place to be buried. <laughs> I, I, I attest to that. It was lovely. It's a charming little town where I, I don't think anything has happened there since the 17th century. I swear to you, the only thing that happened in that town was the birth of, um, of Alexander Dumas. And so um, he was exhumed. I mean, he was there with his mom and dad, and then he was carried into, um, into Paris with great pomp and circumstance. And then four guardsmen dressed in musketeer uniforms carried his coffin into the Pantheon. So um, the, the French definitely have a flair for the dramatic. And now he is, you see, we can get rid of uh, Victor Hugo. And now the two of them are crypt neighbors. <laughs> they are buried right next to each other. So Victor Hugo, Alexander Dumas, and Emile Zola, uh, the three French authors who are buried in the same crypt in the Pantheon. Um, and um, uh, a, a temple, a church, a cathedral that was supposed to be dedicated to Gene uh, Genevieve uh, of um, um, of uh, Paris, who was whose prayer saved Paris from the attack of Attila the Hun, and I posted those images um, in one of my comments yesterday. It's pretty, pretty astonishing to be in a place in Paris that is dedicated to the the burial sites of all of the greatest French men and women um, since the 18th century. And then all of a sudden the walls are decorated with Attila the Hun and the heroic French effort um, and the prayer of Parisian women that saved Paris from the attack. It's, it's, it, you just can't make this stuff up. I think, um, I think Alexander Dumas would have loved the fact that he is buried in such a colorful place. <laughs> All right, well, we did have one last question about Dumas before we bring things to a close here. Uh, Mike had said, and I apologize if I butcher this name, but what role do you think that Dumas uh, historical advisor, uh, Auguste McKay uh, played in writing his books? Yes, so that is the $1 million question, right? Because um, copyright did not exist at the time the way it exists today. And um, the person, um, they, they were collaborators on plot lines. And then um, there were assumptions that perhaps some of the plot elements were developed by this ghostwriter or this assistant writer. And then Alexander Dumas got all the accolades and fame. And I would have to do a lot more research to see just how much of uh, the, the plot elements uh, were developed in collaboration or perhaps even utilized by Alexander Dumas. Um, but you know, I don't know. It's, 
it's it's uh, it's hard to tell. It's it's hard to fathom that somebody would have written so many very long and very thrilling novels. Um, and um, if there was an element of collaboration that went into the creation of these thrilling books, then more power to both of them. Anything else? That was the last question that we had uh, in the chat and we're at right an hour, I think. So okay. perhaps this is a good place to bring the Count of Monte Cristo yes. to a close. Well, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, at one point, somebody, oh, why do I not comment on readers' comments? One, I have no time. <laughs> I read them. Thank you so much for commenting. Without your comments, I would have a hard time continuing my tutorials because it's so amazing to actually see that people read my outpourings, which is just stunning. And I'm so really, really grateful to all of you. Um, but I don't comment on them because as soon as I comment on a comment, then that entire post becomes the first post and then it just constantly messes with the lineup of the posts. And so I hope you realize by now that if you want to read my post in chronological order, you just have to tap or click on my image and then all of my posts appear in chronological order. But then I did read one comment um, that suggested that wouldn't it be fun to talk about just the women of um, in the Count of Monte Cristo and that would be totally amazing. And we. I wish we would have time to talk about a character like Mercedes. Um, I just feel that what happens to her is completely devastating. She um, she did not ask for this, and um, I don't think she deserves this. It, it's it's too harsh. It um, and what is even worse, what happens to her son? Um, you know, this this kid. I, he probably is going to get killed. I mean, he is not Maximilian. Maximilian knows how to fight. Maximilian has. That, that fire in the belly that helps a man survive on the battlefield. He not only can survive on the battlefield, he can pull hapless Franz, the PA of the battlefield, and, and um, you know, be responsible for his, for his life. But Mercedes, it's too much. And, um, and she's a very proud woman. Um, do you remember how often it is mentioned that she's a Catalan, that she's not French? And there's this incredible pride in Mercedes. And I think she walks out um, and it's very hard for her to walk out um, holding her head up. But um, do you remember the conversation that Madame Danglar has with her lover um, about all the money he made for her on the stock market and how she can, you know, I mean, he's throwing her away. You know, I, I used her, this was fun. You know, I used you completely and now you are a rag and I'm throwing you away and we are splitting the money 50-50. Thanks so much for the memories. And, um, and Mercedes just walks out a queen. She, she does not sully herself in any of this um, haggling for, um, for little bits and pieces of her former life. She is a magnificent character and she's a true tragic character in this novel. Um, I admire Mercedes so much and, um, and um, she's dealt a very, very harsh um, lot in life. Um, and um, Haide is a character who appeals to someone like Monte Cristo because he, he does not belong to this world of one thing or another. Um, just that there's this fluidity about Haide that appeals to him. So, um, and then um, um, who else? Eugenie Danglar. Oh my God. The girl is like, she's running away with her lover and the girls are having fun. And then, you know, they check out into a room at the inn as brother and sister. And then of course, Benedetto falls through the chimney into their bedroom and Dumas actually tells us, and they were in the same bed. <laughs> so there you have it. Can you believe this in a 19th century novel? So, you know, Monte Cristo runs away with a young lady who was a, a, a Turkish slave. Um, but she is, she's Christian and she lives in this Greek Ottoman um, world. And then Eugenie Danglar lives her life of, as an artist with her lover. And uh, that is absolutely thrilling. And then, um, and then of course we have, um, um, oh my gosh, Maximilian's love of his life. Help me. <laughs> 
Valentine, um, Valentine. Valentine, Valentine, right, right, right. And Valentine is just like her mother. Remember the Samaran family? Uh, we meet them at the very, very beginning of the novel. They are like big time royalists from Marseille, very aristocratic, very wealthy. And her mother was a saint. And, um, and um, she, um, she's, she's just like her mother, very, very sweet, very kind, very loving. Uh, the relationship between Valentine and Old Noirquet is one of the most amazing relationships in the entire novel. She has such incredible patience and love for him uh, whenever you have this conversation between them. And I love the fact that Valentine immediately teaches the speaking code to Maximilian. So even though Maximilian meets um, Noirquet for the first time, he can communicate with him and he has the patience to bring out a, a diary. That's what I remembered so much when, when I was reading this novel the, for the first time when I was 16. It just seemed incomprehensible to me. Like you, when you were 16, you have zero patience. And, and, and then just the painstaking love that Valentine had for her grandfather, where she would just patiently bring out a diary, a oh, uh, dictionary, and then would go down the alphabet and just find the one word that he was trying to express. It, it's a beautiful relationship. And it's so sweet that, um, that um, um, the Count of Monte Cristo tells the young couple that Norte is waiting for you and he is ready to bless Bless the bride, and um, he he can't wait to enjoy the the blessings of your love and the blessings of your marriage. And um, so yes, Eugenie Danglar, wow. <laughs> and um, yes, yes. So um, oh yes, go ahead. I have a question, and I thank you first of all. Thank you so much. Just my pleasure. From the bottom of my heart, you. <laughs> You have been such an important part of getting through this very challenging time. Uh, war and peace got me through, you know, last summer. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read this book before. All, all the books I'm reading for a second time with you, and I'm so grateful. It just takes it to a whole other level. <laughs> but my question with Dumas is, I was a French minor, you know, Francophiles. Um, my impression, because I read The Count actually just a few years ago, I was, that it, it wasn't, that it really isn't taken seriously in the academy as like this serious piece mm -hmm. of French literature. And so part of my experience in going to it again with you mm -hmm. is recognizing the depth and mm -hmm. and the the influence you know just like how it permeates so many other things right. in popular culture mm -hmm. and so i'm left with that question is it just i have the wrong impression have the wrong teachers whatever right. and well, it in it, fact is is seen as serious literature my you know i i just don't see him as treated like Flaubert and Stendhal and Hugo. Um. Right, right. It's a shame. It's completely a shame. And um, um, I mean, he just just think of the trial of Fernand. We find out so much about French colonial history. I mean, his indictment of French colonialism is staggering. He he talks and and of course you know Maximilian. Where does he serve in North Africa? Where, where do we send poor hapless um, Albert de Morcer um, to North Africa? So the colonial project is continuing. I mean, France is going to stay in North Africa till after World War II. I mean, Algeria, um, as a matter of fact, um, I was just, as, as I was um, contemplating um, the end of the Count of Monte Cristo, um, Macron just visited North Africa and he was booed there. And, um, and it's amazing because the, the French official line for the booing of Macron in North Africa was, oh, it's the Turks' fault. They made the North Africans unhappy with the French. And then the, the, the Turkish foreign minister had to issue a statement saying, you know, France should just own it. They should just own the fact that they did some pretty awful things in North Africa. And when a contemporary uh, French president is booed in North Africa, there is a reason for this. But, um, but it's amazing that Alexandre Dumas covers all this. I mean, he covers the atrocities that the French committed in Spain in 1823, and he covers the atrocities that the French committed in all of their relationships with uh, 
the Ottoman Turks and also was, uh, was North Africa. So yes, Alexander Dumas is a very serious uh, chronicler of his times. And, and he is so meticulous in explaining just how corrupt this time period was. Uh, we may be swept up by just the, the sheer gloriousness of adventure, but the social commentary is ruthless. And Alexander Dumas is, um, is not holding his punches. And, and he discusses pretty much everything that is happening during this time period. So yes, I have no idea why Dumas is not earning more respect in the academy, but you can tell that Anna Barker does not have um, all that much excitement about what happens in the academy. I mean, my, my most important thing is not to read literary criticism, but to read the books. And, um, and I feel that um, literary criticism is prioritized and, and books themselves are not read. Um, and so um, there's actually a moment in Brother Scaramazzo, which we read a year ago, where this uh, very young teenager, Kolinka Krasotkin, uh, wants to prove to Alyosha Karamazov that he's really, really smart. And he start, starts talking about Eugene Onegin. And, um, uh, and Alyosha Karamazov is a saint. And he very gently, very, very gently asks Kolinka Krasotkin, um, by the way, have you read Eugene Onegin? And Kolinka Krasotkin puffs up his teenage, uh, teenage chest and said, I read a book about Eugene Onegin. And so I always, I always read that passage to my students as this glorious example. I mean, Dostoevsky knew everything, right? As this glorious example of what happens in the academy. And I just tell them, you know, was me I'm going to read the books. And we're actually reading Pushkin right now. Oh my gosh, I'm reading um, Pushkin with my students and they are loving it. The, I asked them to read the first canto of Paltava and then I, I sheepishly came to class just assuming that half of them would have dropped the class by the time they realized that they have to read 500 pages of poetry in English translation. And I came back and I'm like, I'm shocked you're still here. And then I very sheepishly said, how many of you read? Ten to one, and all of them raised their hands. And I just said, "Stop it, kids! You're going to make me cry. This is just unbearable." So yes, I'm all about just reading the book and giving all respect to the author and the book because um, they matter to me. And I'm so glad that I can share my enthusiasm for these books with all of you. So, um, <laughs> the miserable all the way to December 10. Then sleep. <laughs> then not a worry. And then um, we literally need to do a year of Duma. I can't let go of Duma. So let's let's commit one year. We're going to do Three Musketeers in the spring, and then we're going to do the sequel, whatever it's called in the summer, and then the sec second se sequel in the fall. And uh, so get ready for Louis the Thirteenth and uh, Reformation Wars. So we'll be talking about serious things, um, but we will, um, we will spend a whole year on three novels of Dumas. And then um, we have to do more Dostoevsky because uh, you know, there's, there's more of that. And then we should just do a year of um, all of Lord Byron. So we'll have our Byronic year and we'll have our Dumas year and then fine, we'll do like, you know, Don Quixote at some point, uh, but just please, like I would have to be completely nuts to do Goethe's Faust, but I love that book so much and it would require way too much of me um, to do Goethe's Faust, but we'll do, we'll, 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 you know, just, just give me, give me another five years and I'll have the courage to do Goethe's Faust. <laughs> and um, I just got a comment for, yay for more Dumas, and that's a great way to end this conversation. So 